Hey, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amina Tariq, and I'm the National Office for Public Health, IFMC Pakistan. Uh, today, the topic we are going to discuss is the mental health crisis due to COVID-19 pandemic and the overall lockdown situation. So uh, just a quick uh, reminder, please try to mute your microphones and I would like you to hold your questions until the end. Thank you. Okay, let's start off. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, Heba, could you move on to the next slide to start off? All right, so this entire webinar we've divided into a few sections to better explain and elaborate upon the different issues that we're facing in this uh, pandemic. So the first thing that I'm going to be talking about with you all is managing our stress, anxiety, and depression in the situation of quarantine and isolation that we're going through. Now, just to give a brief overcap, we're all going through all this stuff together at the moment, which is that, um, in the situation we're faced right now, where we're all mostly in quarantine or our cities and country is in relative lockdown, we're tending to be alone with ourselves. And that means being alone with your thoughts as well. And that it's in itself can be a major source of developing anxiety and depression. Okay, but next slide. So, I'd actually like to start off with a quote that I found from a BBC article, which is that a lot of anxiety is rooted in worrying about the unknown and waiting for something to happen, agree? And coronavirus is actually that on a macro scale, uh, spoken by Rose, Rosie Weatherly, a spokesperson for mental health on charity. So if, um, if we delve more into this quote, it's I found it very relative, um, relatively important to say, because um, it's true. Anxiety in itself is just worrying about the unknown. And what in this situation we have with COVID-19, there is so much unknowns. We don't know where we're going with this. We don't know what the outcome will be. We don't know if things will be normal. So the question comes is, um, how can we protect our mental health in this time? Hiba, can we go forward? Uh, next one. Yeah. Uh, could I remind everyone to please mute their mics? All right, so moving on, uh, I'd like to remind you all that in terms of the solutions that I'm going to talk about, these are relative um, solutions and just basic guidelines per se. So it doesn't mean that you have to do all of these. And it also doesn't mean that in case someone does all of these, that it will actually succeed in relieving your stress or anxiety. But yes, they have been proven to for most people, and everyone has their own approach to things. So what I'd like for each of you to do is find out which of these you feel would more personally um, help you in relieving your stress and anxiety and which of these do you feel wouldn't so by that you yourself can make your own pattern or ways or coping on how to stay um, healthy in this situation so anyways we're, go we're gonna go over each point in um, one by one and i'll explain each of it so as you can see on the slides, uh, there's acknowledging your feelings. So whatever you're feeling right now, you need to know that it's okay to feel that way. So you have to allow yourself time to notice and express what you're feeling. This could be through journalism or just talking to other people's, or you can even channel these emotions into something more creative. So, you know, uh, poetry or drawing or whatever. 
And another way after that is once that you acknowledge it, you can practice um, a mechanism, any strategy such as mindful meditation exercises to help stay grounded in this midst of emotional feelings. Uh, so once you learn how to witness and let your thoughts flow and go at their own pace, you'll know how to hand, handle not getting overwhelmed day activities as much as possible. Now, in the situation we are facing right now, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that we can't have the same routine we used to have before. Many of us have been called off from colleges, from their workplaces, and from their regular routines, but that's why it's so much more important to have your own at home. So you can go back to the basics, just eating healthy meals, keeping your physical activity, getting enough sleep. So even if you're in self-quarantine, there's many ways to develop this. The next three points that you can see on the slide are actually very closely related. It's all about your perspective. So you need to focus on what you do know as opposed to what you don't. You need to focus on what you can do as opposed to what you can't. And you need to keep your perspective. So to further elaborate or just discuss this a bit more so that everyone's on board with me, whenever you notice that you know um, your anxiety will, will tend to lead you to thinking about what if scenarios, right? So you're going to think about um, what if I get the virus, you know, what if uh, this goes, the quarantine gets delayed more and more. So rather than thinking about what if those what ifs, you should know what you do know. So what you do know is that majority of the people getting COVID-19 have minor or manageable symptoms. Majority of the people do get better, right? And when you're thinking about um, focusing on what you can do as opposed to what you can't, so sure you can you know play go out and do the sports that you normally would maybe you can't go to the gym anymore but what you can do is that you can put your focus onto other things that you would before i'll give a perspective before this whole pandemic i did not have time for other things i would have liked to do for example learning the piano i've I've bought one and I've had it at home, but I just never found the time keeping up with uh, my college routine. But now that I don't have those, I have a newfound opportunity and more time on my hand to do things at home that I couldn't before, right? So that's one good way to uh, keeping yourself out of anxiety. And in terms of keeping your perspective, is this about rather than imagining the worst case scenario and worrying about it, you need to ask yourself if, um, if, if something come, is that like really the right way to go about it? Are you overestimating how bad the consequences will be? Because remember, um, for example, you should be mostly mild and most people will recover. Um, and if you're underestimating your ability to cope, sometimes you have to give yourself some pod positive perspective to that. There's a few coping mechanisms and ways that you can strategize yourself out of um, stress and anxiety, and we'll discuss those a bit forward. Eva, can we go to the next slide? All right, so moving on, as you can see on the slides, on the screens that shared, we have just a few more points left. And uh, these points are going to be more focused on, on, on uh, pandemic facing right now. So number one, you need to limit the news and be careful of what you read. So um, a lot of misinformation is often swirled around, especially in the early days. A lot of us may have um, thought of an example of which they did not get the correct information that it actually was, because there's a lot of unknowns in this. For example, it previously unknown if uh, animals can be carriers, previously unknown, how long um, the virus stays on various surfaces, right? So you try to, there's two things to this. One, you have to be careful of what you read by staying informed by trusted sources only. So for example, the WHO or, or the government in your country, 
So those are trusted sources that you should believe. Um, try not to go off just general articles on Facebook that you see or um, get sent something on WhatsApp. Issues. Anywho, uh, we'll get back to what we we're talking about. Also, um, I saw a question in the chat about how long the meeting will take. It'll be approximately one hour. So hopefully we should wrap up by around 8.30. Anywho, um, I apologize for the delay. Uh, going back to what we were talking about, about limiting the news and being careful of what you read. So as we discussed, uh, one, there can be misinformation, and two, you need to limit the time that you're spending or reading on watching things that aren't making you feel better. So an excessive amount of negative information as media tends to... Uh, um, media tends to, to dramatize or increase um, uh, the news. Uh, people have recovered from the coronavirus, more new cases there are. So that can lead to a little um, raising levels of anxiety as well. So you need to limit the time that you're spending or watching these things. Maybe perhaps you decide on a specific time or of day. In you should not be on it the whole time. Very similar to that is having breaks from social media and mute things which are triggering. So that's pretty straightforward. Just mute the keywords that might be triggering for you on Twitter or you should follow or mute accounts that are spreading uh, a negative effect towards on these things. Once again, um, muting WhatsApp groups or hiding Facebook feeds if you find them too overwhelming for yourself if you don't want to think about it that much. Once, the next point is, once again, a very specific thing to our pandemic in terms of our levels of anxiety is to wash your hands, but not excessively. If we're on the topic of mental health, then aside, um, aside raised levels of anxiety and um, stress, um, people who have um, other cases, for example, OCD, uh, OCD action has been seen in increased amounts in um, this situation. So being told to constantly wash your hands and if you're forced to stay at home is something that can make OCD worse. And uh, it can be difficult to hear that for someone who's actually already going through it. So you have to be careful about that as well. And the next thing which I feel is the most important Staying connected with people, once again, makes sense. You've got to stay in touch with those who will help about, well, and take care of you. But staying in touch with the right people means but it should be with those people who care about you or you care about and will help maintain a good mental health during those long periods of self-isolation. So, one, there needs to be a balance between your routine and connecting with people. And you have to make sure you actually feel productive or good about it. You're not connecting with people who are making you feel is here is to avoid burnout. So what that means is that within these weeks and months of trying to stay. Um, uh, stay uh, exercised to eat well and hydrated at all times. So Anxiety UK actually practices this technique called the Apple technique to deal with anxiety and worries. All right, guys. Uh, hey, my name is Hedi. I am one of the presenters for today. Rafi is unable to join us. He is having bad in internet issues we've all been there so uh first of all we pray for rafi and we hope his internet comes back online yeah ptcl and fall very true um again i would urge you all to keep your microphones on mute so that we can sort of complete this in a timely manner inshallah so i will be continuing from where rafi left off uh we were going to talk about a few coping mechanisms so uh, so you see in front of you a few familiar names you look at meditation, you can grounding, self 
clinicians, deep breathing, and PMR. Being medical students, once or twice, we must have seen these things, if not heard about them, pehle, but I'm going to give you guys a brief rundown. So now before we do anything else, I want you to understand a very simple principle about this webinar. I want you to listen to everything I say and find what's wrong in it. I want you to go through whatever I'm telling you, just nitpick it. Think to yourself, this person told me this particular thing, but it's wrong because of this. I want you to think of why what I'm telling you is wrong, of how it is wrong, because no solution is perfect. Every solution has its pros, every solution has its cons, right? So the idea behind this is to make you understand that it is not logistically possible for us to tell you a solution to your personalized problem that you're facing in this pandemic by a general approach, right? So the idea is we would like you to think about what we're telling you wrong, okay? So with that, we would like to move forward. Uh, should we type the questions in and have them answered at the end? Um, how about you reserve your questions for the end and we can answer them in a one by one fashion, right? We'll have time at the end. Don't worry about that. All right. So meditation, you all know what meditation generally is. Meditation is, is the act of sort of like, you know, calming your mind and sort of, sort of giving yourself the room to breathe. Usually what happens is that when we're in a state of panic or when we're in a state of anxiety, what happens? is that we're flooded with thoughts we're flooded with emotions can everyone hear me uh, i'm just going to continue speaking i i hope i i think there is a problem with the internet on someone's end but i hope it's resolved soon but either way i'll still continue um you'll have Anyhow. to join audio if you're connecting from your phone you'll join audio so that you can hear all right uh, thank you thank thank you amna All right, so we're talking about meditation, guys. So the idea behind meditation is to sort of clear your mind of any excess thought that you may be having and any, any, any excess thought, any excess feeling that you're feeling that especially you don't really know where to place, right? So the idea is to just sit down, focus on your breathing and just focus on one thing, right? There are so many ways you can do meditation. There are so many different variations. We won't be getting into the nitty gritty of that because again, the idea is to tell you about certain things that you can research on so that you can find your own personalized solution because it's pretty impossible for us to give each and every one of you your personalized solution in this short amount of time. But that doesn't mean we can't do what we can. So anyhow, the next thing we're going to talk about is grounding, right? So grounding people may have heard of it. Generally, we generally use the phrase, so I'm going to try to ground myself in a situation. But what that generally means is that when you're having an anxiety attack or when you're having a panic attack or when you're just plain frustrated, the idea is that you are not present in the moment. You're not present in the present time. You're either worrying about something that has happened before or you're worrying about something that will happen later in the future or you're using what happened in the past as a reference and then coming up and cooking up these scenarios that you think are going to happen in the future. You see, that fear is real. That fear you're feeling is real, but that danger is, it comes from your mind, right? So the idea is to trick your mind into coming back to the present moment. This is where grounding comes in. Grounding, basically the general idea, again, I'm just going to give you the general idea. There are so many ways you can ground yourself, right? So the general idea is to use your five senses, right? All five of your senses to sort of like ground yourself in the present moment. If if you're having a panic attack or an anxiety attack, the general approach is to say count five blue things around your around yourself, your five brown things around yourself, or feel the texture of your shirt, or feel the texture of something that is nearby. Right. So the idea is to just use what is in your surrounding to remind yourself that you are not in your thoughts. You are in a room full of people or on your own. And you're surrounded by these many things, right? So again, the idea of grounding is to help someone who is having trouble with anxiety ground themselves and sort of be present in the moment, you know, and not in their own head, not lost in their own thoughts, okay? The next idea is self-affirmations, right? So 
self affirmations are sort of interesting in the sense that what is any behavior that we that we experience any any emotion that we experience any thought that we have is in response to a situation right that thought is basically something that we have been conditioned to think right it is our conditioned response to a thought that gives us an emotion right and that emotion is what we then hold on to latch on to or maybe we just let it go if we're really good with these things so what happens is that the idea of self affirmations comes in when you have problematic conditioning right when you have problematic conditioning especially when it comes into the entire thing about self esteem when it comes into the entire thing about how we now are using more social media than ever especially in this pandemic right because we don't really have much to do okay we just sort of like excuse me we just sort of like uh, log on to social media and we follow our instagram influencers or we follow or, or, or we follow bloggers or we do a number of things right so the idea is that when that happens uh that when that happens it generally is postulated to take a hit on your self esteem because you compare and contrast oh this person is living life in this particular manner but this person is not i am not living this life that this person has and you start comparing and contrasting and that usually makes you feel pretty bad right so the idea is that you recondition yourself to sort of think differently that's the, that's the idea here uh, could we go back to that slide yes thank you so um, you, how do you do this the general idea is pretty simple you literally you literally just tell yourself what you want to think you tell yourself and you repeat what you want to think it can be in the mirror it can be just yourself वैसे ही like on your own repeat it a number of times in the start it's going to be difficult and then it will gradually become easier till that will become your go to response for a situation an example of an affirmation would be i will control my thoughts and my thoughts will not control me right i will not compare uh, uh, my lifestyle to the lifestyle of an instagram blogger and i will choose to be happy with what and all that i have these are examples of some affirmations you can cook up your own affirmations there is absolutely no restriction to that choose the affirmation that works for you and just practice it practice and repeat that's the idea behind it because just like any good conditioning you need to repeat it you need to repeat it so that it becomes your instinct your second nature your response right so that's the idea again research a lot about it there's so much to know so much to practice so much to tell other people because yeah deep breathing again okay so deep breathing basically helps with sort of like improving your mindfulness and again your attention and focus so again we won't really go into detail on this because it's a practical maneuver so you have to sort of like understand how to do it you know going to have to research progressive muscle relaxation progressive muscle relaxation is the same you can you can research it you can find out your own variation that works for you but the idea is the same practice repeat find out what works for you and tell the people to do the same or right, can we move on to the next slide all right so next we're going to come on to the second topic which is taking care of ourselves and those around us next slide please thank you all right i'd like to start with a quote that i read online self care is giving the world the best of you instead of what's left of you said by kt reed now i'm not familiar who kt reed is because it wasn't written but i agree with what she said anyhow let's move forward all right uh, no i think we skipped a slide yeah so first of all the problems the problems you may generally be feeling right now again this is a gross over simplification we're just going for the main general idea so you can either be feeling lonely or detached when you take social distancing too far for example there are some people who now that they have more time are sort of like connecting with more people okay so i have to catch up with this number of people i'm going to catch up with all of them there are those kind of people but then there are some there are other people who actually have taken social distancing distancing by too far social distancing in the physical aspect is one thing but distancing yourself socially when it comes to social media when it comes to talking to people in activity in general again when you know you have to do something but you're not able to do it because you just don't feel like it because you feel exhausted on the project that's also a problem 
So you need to take care of your productivity. And then most importantly, you don't take care of your, take care of your physical health. You don't care, you don't take care of your personal grooming, you don't take care of your meals, you don't take care of your nutrition, and all, all those kinds of things. We'll discuss them one by one. Okay, could we move forward, please? All right, so here are a couple of ideas, right? Again, these are ideas that we've generally uh, curated from talking to different people, searching online. Some may work for you, some may not. Maybe none of these work for you, maybe all of them work for you. It's a general idea, right? So the basic idea is that you need to bring some form of structure to your life so that you regain control, so that you feel in control, right? One of the ideas is like Rafa mentioned, you need to make a schedule, you need to sort of like uh, stick to it. Pair. The schedule can be anything as long as you start off with it. It can be one simple thing in the day that you know you have to dedicate this many minutes in a day to something that you would like to do productively. Right? Right? You, and now the idea to think that everything is normal in the first place. Right? So when before this pandemic, you used to do a number of things in the morning every day, and that was part of your routine. You, know, you got up, you got dressed, you, go, you went to college, you went to the office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now you can't really go to the office, you can't really go to college, etc. But you can still do the rest of it, right? In order to trick your mind into sort of like thinking that, oh, you know what? It's a normal day. I'm going to get up. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to get dressed, and then you can just sit in a designated workspace that you have. Sort of like get, sort of like trick yourself into getting into that that workplace zone, and then you can just get what you need to do done. You know, with regards to assignments, with regards to coursework, or whatever goal that you have, right? And that's how you simulate your wanted routine, right? And that's how we, we hope you can sort of gain some form of structure back in your life, right? The next idea is to sort of like breathe in fresh air as much as possible because again, if you're staying inside in your home, in your room for the better part of weeks on end, then it's going to be a problem because we as humans are social animals, right? And even if, in, and even if we're going outside and not talking to a lot of people, even if we stay detached from nature far too long, it's going to mess with our mental health, right? So what I'm suggesting is just, if possible, if you have a balcony in your house, if you have, uh, if you have a window in your house, just open the window, let in, let in some fresh air or go outside and sit on the balcony at sunrise or at sunset, or if possible, early morning, maybe, maybe go out and take a walk in your porch. Anything that helps you sort of get a bit of fresh air. Because again, owing to the stoppage of traffic and all, we we have better air quality. So my, we might as well make use of that, you know. So yeah. Next, a really important thing that a lot of people, including me, have neglected is your diet, especially your supplementation, right? Vitamin D is one nutrient that we're pretty much all deficient in. And vitamin D deficiencies are somewhat linked, linked to the onset of depression as well, right? So the idea here is pretty simple. Usually you'd get some of your vitamin D from staying in the sun, right? In your day-to-day -day activities, it's the summer, you have a lot of sun exposure, but now when you're home, you don't have that sun exposure. Regularly, you're still deficient in vitamin D. Pretty much most of the population is still deficient in vitamin D. But right now, you're not even getting that vitamin D that you used to. So you're increasing your risk of, you know, that correlation that it has with depression for sort of developing. So the idea is to just take your supplementation, do your research, take care of your diet, and just sort of like, you know, make yourself feel good with these small little hacks. Right, again, the most important thing next is incorporating feel-good activities in moderation. If you do something that is feel-good for an entire day, for about a week or two weeks, it's eventually not going to feel good. It, it's going to lose its charm, right? If you watch shows for two weeks, three weeks on end, there, there are only show, so many shows you can watch. There's only so much Netflix you can watch. It's going to be a problem. So just consider varying it in moderation. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. All right, so that was for how you take care of yourself and how you could maybe, you know, take care of your world inside you, you know? These are a set of ideas that you can do to, that you can maybe incorporate into taking better care of the people around you because everyone is an individual in the community. They can add this and cumulatively it comes out to be a lot. So maybe it'll help all of us sort of 
go past this very difficult time collectively, you know? So the idea is again, reconnect with people. And if you feel like it's too much, if you feel like there's just too many people to reconnect with, it's been so long that it's going to be awkward that you haven't messaged for so long and you're waiting for someone else to message first, then one thing you need to realize is that every, if everyone keeps waiting for another to message first, then, then you're just gonna keep waiting. Odds are you're just gonna keep waiting. So just do both of you guys a favor, just message and ask about someone, you know? You can keep a target, baby steps. Start with one person a day, okay? Keep a target. I'm going to talk to one person today and catch up with them. Then make it two, three, four, or whatever thing you wanna do. Again, personalize it and make it yours. Next, talk to grandparents or elders. You see, because they aren't particularly used to the internet. We log on to Netflix, we log on to YouTube, Facebook, we talk to our friends, we play games. Our grandparents don't have that. Our grandparents usually have social support in the form of their grandchildren coming to meet them over or you know, just sort of like sitting and talking with them. But in this day and age, they, there aren't a lot of people coming to their house in the first place. So the idea is to just sit and talk with them and just sort of let them know that they aren't just home alone, you know? Just not make them feel alone. So that's something that you could do to sort of take care of your grandparents and sort of make sure they don't fall into that, into that entire rabbit hole of feeling bad about themselves, feeling sad, feeling depressed, because that's going to lower their immune system even further and make them more susceptible uh, to the disease in itself or any of the common priorities they may or may not have. Again, routinely arrange game day sessions with friends. The idea is to just plan to have fun. Make plans as usual, trick your brain into normalcy. That's the idea. Just hold on to that normalcy for as long as this entire thing. Extra care when approaching elders. Now, when you sit with your elders for a long period of time, and especially if you're someone who is going outside to get some stuff from the market, going out and coming back inside, you're risking exposure, not only to yourself, but to the people around you as well. Heba is going to talk more about this when we talk about uh, the fears of medical professionals, but I'm just going to mention that you need to take care when it comes to your elders because they're a susceptible population. Anyone who has chronic lung disease, anyone who has a number of comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes, people of extremes of age, they're all at risk. So you need to take care of these things when it comes to sort of like, you know, uh, talking to them. But that, that raises its own set of problems, which usually arise in a lot of conflict, right? Now conflict will be explained by Ibrahim. So I think that's all from me. Could we move on to the next slide? And over to you, Thank Ibrahim. Thank you so much, Thank you. Heather. So let's start. Uh, Heba, could you move to the next slide, please? Heba, am I audible? Great. So, interpersonal conflicts. We now be discussing that you know, uh, in this uh, under un, during this lockdown, you know, a lot of you are you know going through a lot of expressions, a lot of stuff, right? So how could it possibly turn out for you, right? So um, first, let's just define what an interpersonal conflict is. It's a conflict in which there is disagreement in some manner, which can be emotional, physical, personal, or professional between two or more people, right? Considering the fact that um, you guys are locked in like a lockdown, um, most of you are like with your families, right? Throughout this entire period, right? So what, it could, what could happen is that potentially all the negative feelings that you have could be channeled in that direction and like you can be in any sort of conflict with any of your family members right if like you know it could get worse it could lead to probably domestic abuse as well right however that's necessarily not it it's not limited to you know your family members it could also be friends or other people that you're connected with in this lockdown right and it could be due to any reason right so what could be the reasons it could be anxiety or stress like the feelings that you're going through right now it could be any of the misunderstandings that you have with that other person. It could be any disagreement on, on any topic. It could be any ego issue. Johnny Bravo clearly is like, you know, depicting it in this picture. And it could be any meta conflict. Like, for example, there's a conflict and then you have a conflict about that conflict, right? And about resolving that conflict, right? So it could be any of that. Could you move on to the next one? Hello? 
HEPA. Great. So an there are like a lot of ways to express conflict, right? It could be expressed verbally, it could be expressed non-verbally, right? So there's an entire spectrum as to how, you know, you can express it or it could be expressed by someone else and how you can perceive it, right? So it could be, you know, a cold shoulder or it could be an obvious blowout. You don't know what, how it is going to be in a, in a person because like it varies from person to person, right? So some of the like normal standardized signs uh, include, you know, an aggressive body language and, you know, conversations that are sullen or apprehensive. If they happen at all, that is, there could be heated arguments, there could be negative facial expressions, and you know, there could be a lack of candor, openness, or honesty, right? So it is very important to, you know, solve these interpersonal conflicts because if they are left unsolved, it can lead to, you know, loss of respect for both the individuals that are involved in the conflict on both of their parts, right? And others as well, probably. So could we move on to the next slide? Could we move on to the next slide? Great. So um, there are a lot of approaches to, you know, interpersonal conflict and conflict resolution, right? However, in order to properly avoid it, properly resolve it, we need to be careful of how we are going to approach it, right? We need to first identify what type of conflict it is, right? Because um, conflict, because like when you are in close relationships or like when you are living with other people, it's like inevitable. So it can have a negative emotional toll on you as well as the other party involved, right? So it takes a lot of effort, you know, to be ignore, to, to ignore someone or to be passive aggressive with someone or, to, you know, be angry at someone, right? So, uh, however, it, is, it isn't always like negative or unproductive. So uh, what you have to do is that you have to ensure that your approach is right. So first you identify what type of conflict it is. It could be a conflict in which there could be a misunderstanding as a have different goals or they have different perspectives or anything but it's not necessarily different it's just like their belief that tells them that it's different or anything like that so it's like not proper conflict but like it's built upon misunderstandings and you know other varying beliefs that one might have so yeah um apart from that the second one is like value conflict so this kind of conflict comes up when like different personal values lead to disagreement, right? So for example, let's say if you and your friend are having a general conversation and like you have different views on abortion rights or something, and you know, or, or like, let's say you are leaves, it could potentially lead to a value conflict where it's the values that come in play, right? Then there's meta conflict, a con because of conflicts, um, can you get this again? Great. So um, it happens when, uh, for example, uh, let's say that you always not long, but you ne never actually hear what I'm saying. You know, that's so unfair. That's not what we're talking about at all, et cetera, et cetera, right? Stuff like that. So it's basically a conflict about a conflict. You're discussing something and then you feel that you're not discussing it right or the other person is not discussing it right or they're not doing it the way you want it to be. So you have a conflict out of that conflict, right? So now the question is that, you know, what's the right way to decide your resolution strategy? So there are multiple resolution strategies with, with which you can address your conflict. So for example, there is withdrawal, there is competition, there is um, communication, conflict resolution, there's accommodation. We'll be discussing each one separately. Rupa, can you move on to the next slide, please? Great. So um, uh, before um, so uh, before resolving any conflict, it's important for you to like think it through properly because you need to understand that it doesn't only involve you, it also involves the other person, right? So what you need to do is maybe um, consider it with someone else, right? And then, you know, clarify everything, seek feedback from them and advice in dealing with that situation, right? But make sure that, you know, you have a proper strategy in mind in order 
to resolve that conflict and you identify it properly. So one way could be withdrawal, right? So when should you withdraw? Whenever there is like an intense conflict or an unimportant conflict that like necessarily doesn't hold any value to you or could it impact anything going on in your life, right? So when you withdraw from a conflict, you're basically avoiding that problem, right? You don't talk about it or you only talk about it in roundabout ways, right? So um, it, it's like sort of avoiding the other person or avoiding the conflict in general, right? So how can you do that? There's a number of ways you can ignore the other person. You can refuse to discuss the issue because like it's making you uncomfortable or something, or you don't want to necessarily talk about it because it's like a waste of your time and energy you can shut the other person down entirely you can you know physically withdraw from conflict in case like you know you're in some sort of a situation with your sibling and you can brush off the problem right so what happens is that you know withdrawal can worsen the problem or at least it could you know make it significant over time if you don't properly uh, address that problem at that point in time right because your feelings are unresolved, you didn't discuss it, there's no clarity in it. So withdrawal is uh, could, is not necessarily the you know, best tr strategy to go, go on about. However, um, it's one of the options that there and if you feel that you know, uh, it's feasible in that point in time, you can use it. Can we move on to the next one? Great. So the next strategy is, you know, communicating with the other person and, you know, resolving the conflict. So as I already told you, you have, if like you're going for that, if you're going to resolve the conflict entirely, you have to think it out properly. You have to make sure that you discuss it with someone else and you have to make sure nothing goes wrong. There is no, you know, meta conflict that comes out of it and it's properly resolved, right? So what you do is, that, so talking it through has like two different steps, two different ways, right? First, you have to listen to the other person to understand their perspective because of course, if it's a conflict, it's like, you know, bad feelings at both ends. So there might be a difference of opinion, difference of perspective at both ends. So you need to understand that. And in order to understand that, you have to listen. So how do you listen? So first off, you blend with the other person. You, for example, let's say if there's like no um, common thing, within the conflict or like there is some common point within the conflict you necessarily identify that and tell, and tell them that you know you feel the same as well on that point right so essentially that would make them feel that yes both of you are like on the same page or like both of you feel the same way about something in particular which makes them feel included and which makes them feel more accepted within the resolution right then there is backtracking so what you do is you essentially have to backtrack that entire problem started right so um you'll be like okay fine you're in a bad mood but why because something happened but why that thing happened okay that thing happened because of this but who instigated that you know you have to go to the root in order to make sure that the conflict is properly addressed and talked about right so um because at the end of the day it's not the point of views that are wrong it's just the way that you are perceiving it right perceiving it another's perspective that might could lead to a problem or a conflict right so um then you have to clarify everything so for example once to backtrack everything you have to clarify okay so this happened because of this this happened because of this so that at the end of the day both of you have the same understanding of the entire process of the entire conflict right then you have to summarize the conflict right you have to summarize it so that you know uh, it's summarized and it's more easily understandable and it's you know easier to address right then you have to confirm that okay fine this is the um issue that we have summarized so far uh, do we agree or not so that like you know there's agreement on both ends because you are at the end of the day resolving it right so you have to make sure that whatever you have summarized you confirm with the other person as well that you know it's the same thing that you have summarized again so this is one part of it then you have to speak in order to be understood right because you need to put your ideas or put your perspective out there as well, right? So what you do is that you state your intention as to, you know, why are you having this conversation or what was so important within that conflict that made you feel that you should address it right away or like, why is it that you're resolving this conflict, right? 
while maintaining the branding right while you know telling them that you know both of us are in the same page both of us want to you know discuss it want to resolve it but the reason why you felt that this is the right time is this is this is this right and then you put for forth your own requests your own needs you tell them how you feel so that they can understand your point of view as well right so it's good it's a good idea to use a me- mediator you know while resolving these conflicts right or like while communicating with the other person so that nothing goes wrong or like you know at least there's someone to identify if something goes wrong who's and was it so that you know you can apologize whenever it's appropriate or you can apolo- yeah so that's all um apart from that like whenever you feel that um there the other person might be hurt because of what you're saying or even if you feel that the other person might not be hurt still you should apologize try to apologize whenever you feel it's appropriate because an apology can you know get you a lot of stuff it can resolve a lot of conflicts just a simple apology can we move on to the next slide great so apart from that there are other strategies as well so for example uh, uh, in order to resolve a conflict you can you know maybe um, what you can do is like you can force your idea or like you can compete for your idea with the other person so what that essentially does is that often time it leads to an argument or it leads to an endless debate where like bo- if both parties have the same intent and at the end of the day it's like gets very difficult to resolve the conflict right so what happens is that um that you push your own perspective out there and you try to win in that conflict right so that you know you feel that you know you were the right person or your idea was the right one however um if um let's say um that's not necessarily the best strategy to go on about with because at the end of the day even if you were right you're not you know properly communicating it with the other person you're trying to compete with them within the conflict right so you're not understanding their perspective right which could ultimately lead to more and more conflicts in the future right so this is something that you could go on about but it's not the right way to go on about it then there is accommodation so what you can do is that you can accommodate the other person and put their needs above you and you know concede the conflict and say okay fine um you're the you're right and it could be fault on my end for which i apologize start so accommod- uh, we were talking about accommodation right so essentially um uh, the reason why uh, this approach uh, could be good to resolve your family conflicts or interpersonal conflicts within the family is because there is a generation gap of your like you know parents and your grandparents etc etc right so you might not have the same opinion or the same take on things as they do or like as they might not have the same take on things as you do right so this could potentially lead to you know developing a conflict or something uh a disagreement a value conflict essentially so it's better if you addresses address it by accommodating and you know by backing off because at the end of the day you know that, that you know um that's the right strategy for you know brown families so yeah um uh, i guess that's all um i'd be now handing it over to hiba to further explain um hiba's part thank you so much Okay guys I'm so sorry um Are you there? Yeah I'm here. Oh okay great. I was here. Great. So um my topic today is dealing with fears as a frontline health worker. I think this was one of the topic that was requested by you guys when we sent out the questionnaire form to ask which one do you want us to uh, consider important topics. So this since this topic was there uh, we had uh, put this as an important topic. Um I'm not sure how many of you all are currently in your house job or working as doctors or are you just students medical students for so far but we thought we'll just put this in and then we'll talk about the fears that health frontline healthcare workers face so um so to fi- like now in this uh, period of quarantine like people are trapped inside their houses so they're bound towards their home we see doctors they go the opposite way they are forced to be outside at 
the workplace, at the hospitals, at different routines of their lives. Um, they have to go through the process of going self-isolating themselves from their home. So to talk about the fears and the, uh, how to deal with fears as a frontline health worker, I thought first we'll analyze what kind of stress that they face and then we'll go... Um, will go about to see some of the solutions. Some of the solutions have already been mentioned by Rafa and Heather, uh, but we can go over through them in a very mild, minimum way, okay? So these are the four main types of stress that we've gathered. Uh, need to employ strict biosecurity measures. What I mean by this is, for example, uh, when workers are have to face uh, themselves this is a little uh, low right now in pakistan because we have facing the lack of supplies uh, in 95 miles lack of protect protections for example but even with protection there is other side effects that you can you see wearing in 95 miles for extreme long hours of time can cause uh, exhaustion there is uh, this exhaustion dehydration heat body right and then there's physical isolation as well it's not doctors don't have the uh, isolation only from their families but from everyone they are considered a threat themselves, right? So they have to uh, ensure this kind of biosecurity measures and this can cause a drain upon them as well. There is the constant awareness and they have to be on their top, like uh, at the top of their mind, right? Because they are the ones who are at the front of our safety. They are the ones who are taking care of the world right now. So without them, like we'll be the ones in trouble. So at this point, they are in distress. Their minds are at have to be constantly active and have to be constantly vigilant uh, regarding protection methods and regarding the ways they can help the uh, society, the way they can help in finding, for finding new treatments, for example, and ways of minimizing other people's risk as well. Then another um, biosecurity measure that has happened is as days go by, the government, the Ministry of Health, they keep in, uh, instilling like different rules, regulations, right? Like today there'll be this, uh, you have to follow this uh, way of treatment plan and this can change. And then the next day can be another sort of change. Day by day, uh, as research continues about COVID-19, there is different uh, changes and uh, different approaches to, uh, used by the Ministry, the government, WHO to tackle this. So as a country face goes through this process, uh, the doctors have to be in the top of their mind, have to learn new stuff. They were not exposed to this previously. Some of the doctors who are now currently in the up, uh, in the front line weren't even exposed to this kind of emergency measures before, emergency disaster, uh, I mean disaster management before, right? So they are they are out of their safety zone, they are out of their comfort zone, and they have to uh, employ this kind of measures. It's going to be very hectic and stressful on them. Second point is risk of disease transmission. So what happens is, since COVID-19 uh, can have symptoms of various kinds and they can also resemble a common cold flu. And in some patients, the symptoms are asymptomatic. There's no symptoms, they're asymptomatic though they have the uh, COVID-19 virus, right? And then there are people who, even though there is, uh, we have a self-quarantine procedure, uh, like a self-quarantine or a isolation period, um, sorry incubation period of 14 days some people have there are cases where some people have contracted the disease uh, even after 14 days of isolation so this means that this covid-19 technically has has some extreme cases some places where they are not uh, following the proper rules right at this case uh, there is the transmission process and there is also uh, there is the risk of disease transmission through the doctors right different patients come and see doctors and not all of them have been contracted the disease. But there is always a middleman who is a doctor. And they have that risk that they can be, they have the fear that they're the ones who are causing this, right? Uh, as we see, uh, they, as they go uh, in the news, so many doctors have been uh, contacted with the COVID-19 and have passed away. So this means that um, the risk of transmission can occur through doctors as well, right? And it can occur through patients who have not known that they have contracted it. So as a result, there is that uh, stress in healthcare workers. Also, there is a section between doctors are... Uh, <laughs> can you guys turn off your mic? <laughs> Let me mute. Okay. So, um, there is this 
the process of uh, doctors being the front line also means they are the middlemen between the public health industry, public health ministries, and then between the public health priorities and the uh, common people. And we see in the news that there are people who are protesting the quality, you know, uh, regardless how 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 severe the condition is. This pandemic has taken over the world, and people are contrast, uh, protesting against it. We are not following the rules. As a result, there is the middleman who is always uh, who is the doctor is the one who is caught in this tension. Then there is multiple medical and personal demands. So with this quarantine period, as we see, doctors are forced to work extremely long hours. You, they might have been working us just like eight hours a day. They've been forced to work daily night shifts over time because the lack of doctors present who can tackle this disease. And this causes extreme stress. There is burnout, extreme burnout. And there is the fear of infection of between themselves and them being transmitted. There is also the, uh, there is the, the, uh, the need to maintain high standards in this uh, phase of a low frequency event. Like see, this COVID-19 has attacked the world and people are facing it differently. And in Pakistan, we are facing a lot of shortage of uh, treatment. Uh, there is treatment, there is uh, protective barriers, everything is there. So as a result, doctors are facing lots of barriers and they're trying to maintain and give their best regardless of the difficulties and the shortages. This causes additional stresses. And being separated from their families, especially being the workers of their home, they aren't allowed to go home. And even if they're uh, they allowed to go home, if they, uh, the fear of contracting the children around them, the family, the grandparents, those cause extreme fear as well. Then pain of losing colleagues and patients to COVID-19. What happens now is because of COVID-19, even when patients pass away, their families are usually not allowed to go through it. Uh, uh, not lots of family, I'm not 100% sure of the system in Pakistan, but um, patients are, do not have their families by their side, mostly if they pass away in the hospital. As a result, they have the doctors are the patients, uh, the other families who are for the patients and they have to deal with the loss. The, uh, the, uh, the loss of losing their colleague to COVID-19 and the fear of losing their lives as well is a source of consciousness. They are putting themselves in harm's way. So this was a quote that I found in uh, while going through the research that when, uh, uh, when a person is um, going through this process is uh, a quote said by Lee. She said that you must always return to yourselves. Be aware of yourselves and distinguish which emotions are yours and which are the patients and which are your empathy. At this point, compartmentalization is essential in order for, to protect the safety of the patient and the doctor. Uh, the doctor handling all of this by himself, uh, by herself, and ha having to face different kinds of uh, mental attacks, right? They have been uh, like embodied in stress, stress, stress from all kinds of directions. So at this point, compartmentalization is important and necessary. We just help them to uh, help them to let go away with this, I would say, and help you distinguish which emotions they are feeling, which are the patients. Because at this point, what the patients are feeling, the doctors are tend to feel what the patients feel as well. And as I said, they'll be going through the different stages of grief. And at this point, for the safety of the doctor, for protection of the doctor, we, I would say, uh, compartmentalization can be a helpful thing. So some of the solutions that we can go through is, now what happens is feeling stressful and being under pressure is also, is, it is too, like we have uh, doctors are under distress and it is, uh, they should know that it's okay and it's normal, it's fine to be stressed. Like I know it's a difficult situation, but it's okay to be stressed. They are humans as well. They are allowed to be under pressure. They are allowed to feel this way. It's normal to feel this way. And managing your mental health, your psychological well-being is more important in this time. And, and it's as important as maintaining your physical health. Right? And it is important to see that uh, there's so many coping strategies that uh, Heather and Rafi had mentioned. And this uh, can be used to ensure that you are in your physically best at this time. Physical health is also important. So without this, uh, it can affect your mental health. So to take ensuring sufficient rest, to work between, have proper shifting hours. And if you can't, like at least have 
time uh, time gaps time offs between your working to engage in a little bit of physical activity and even though even though you are in isolation with your family from your family there is different ways of talking connecting social distancing doesn't have to be a complete distance you can talk to your family ensure that communicate what your needs are communicate how your feelings are have one person at least that you can share your emotions your feelings to letting this bottle inside you won't help and as uh, this one said talking it out in essential communication is very important and in uh, the problem with doctors is as uh, because of this proper stress they cannot uh, they are forced to work in a high risk environment right so strategies like uh, talking towards peer consultation talking amongst doctors there might be leaders seniors that you can go to talk towards talk to them to be when people, there is group therapy group focusing happening then there is a possibility that your anxieties and your stress can be calmed a little bit it can calm and you have a better working system and a better support system to help you through this difficult time as doctors are there uh, this covid-19 being very new to this world just a couple of months ago there are some information which is still unknown to doctors which is still unknown to world health association and with the news and the media spreading unnecessary unrelated information there is this part where doctors are uh, about to get like you know confused about even what they know is right what they know is wrong so seeking out uh, correct and accurate information and to mentor uh, assist in making decisions there is this fear, uh, there is this fear that what or are you doing this thing right am i treating this patient right am i doing what the by at most best for my patient and in times like this it is, uh, it is uh, helpful if you can gather around other other doctors to help you around and to work in partnership and team also it's important uh, for doctors to understand that you know this is uh, as doctors we we say we like we've uh, joined this profession for a noble cause they've joined this to help take care of patients they've joined to save patients from diseases right and this uh, covid-19 has caused a lot of deaths in this country and around the world and this cause of uh, to a doctor who's being forced to see this level of death uh, can be uh, forced to have the denials and have he have he have to go through the stages of grief and as the, as a result it might affect them and it might affect the future care, uh, taking care of other patients as well right so acceptance would be a good way to take care of it then fostering a spirit of fortitude patience tolerance and hope and hopefully that everything goes well soon so this was a message from who to team leaders regarding the treatment so what they mentioned was who mentioned was that um it's not about uh, doctors keeping doctors working all of, in all uh, working hours in working extremely long hours means that means that they will have better capacity to fulfill their roles but to make sure that what they're doing right so far right now is not a short term process it's a long term they're not uh, working overnight for one day only they're working overnight for months now and as a result mental health is something to take care about and to work make sure that we're working focusing on their longer term occupational capacity than the repeated short term crisis because that will uh, be bound to reach a burnout stage then to ensure communication and proper communication is being passed around right so to have rotation between workers between high stress low stress functions and to partner in experience uh, doctors with experience but well, not everyone is opposed to um, is uh, adapted to this kind of uh, this uh, is uh, can you guys hear me okay um so what happens is uh, doctors obviously are not at all at the same levels of treatment and also same levels of experience right to shift uh, workers between highly experienced one and the non experienced one if for example if we see there are like everyone uh, house offices are working pgs are working and the specialized consultants are working right so to ensure that um but it feels like your voice is coming from far away hello hello hope you can hear me better now um so hold on okay 
Okay, so to have a set of support system and a rotation system that can help both workers, uh, health workers who are less experienced and more experienced, and to use this time as a learning process. And team leaders to ensure available, uh, availability of essential uh, healthcare systems as well. It's not only the people in quarantine who need healthcare health support, but also doctors who are working in this high pressure conditions, uh, high, pre uh, high risk environment, right? So even they need support, the entire world needs mental health care at this stage, right? So at this point, uh, team leaders are also asked to ensure that they provide mental health care towards their team. So here are just a, a few things what doctors can avoid. Uh, working too long by themselves without checking in with colleagues. What happens now is uh, one of the ways uh, people isolate, uh, one of the ways people deal with grief is by isolating themselves. And as a result, this can cause issues. I mean, their, their, their way of avoidance is essentially not a long-term approach and it's not effect, uh, it's not a way of going uh, processing your mental health like this right so working too long by themselves without checking in with colleagues is uh, something a person can avoid to ensure his safety and his health uh, team leaders can obviously work through this by ensuring having group discussions group sessions focus groups for example and working around the clock with few breaks this is actually seen very commonly because of the lack of doctors in the country with a lot of patients what happens is doctors have been working overtime and over overtime with very few breaks we're burning themselves and at a point of uh, burnout but at this point uh, it's also essential that they take care of the health that they are there for our long-term use that they can help the patients in a lot for the long run than being forced to work around feeling that they are not doing enough. This feeling is bound to happen, like, uh, bound to happen and it's also normal, but it's, it's helpful if you can, uh, uh, if doctors, it, it seems so easy to tell, and I know it's a difficult thing to, uh, to accept, but it's better if they avoid these things. Excessive intake of sweets and caffeine. What happens is, um, Coping methods and dealing with stress has led to pay, uh, doctors, for example, like taking up tobacco smoking, excessive uh, intake of caffeine, excessive intake of sweet to make sure that they are up and energetic. But this can uh, cause a damp, uh, then dampen their mental health, their mind, their critical thinking, for example, and may cause uh, risk to their physical health as well. So, also demotivating talks among yourselves, among you, like uh, people do say this, like, you know, I mean, this doctor worked this many hours of the day, so I also should work this many hours of the day. Uh, they, uh, I cannot take, people are dying around here, and how can I take rest? Uh, people are doing this, so how can I do this? I mean, my job is a doctor, so I'm supposed to do all I can do for the patients. It's, it's understandable, but also mental health taking care of yourself is also a priority for doctors right uh, without you guys the patient the world is not going to uh, this is not going to ha help themselves so uh, it is kind of important and the for you the doctors as frontline health workers to essentially take care of themselves as well as taking care of us so this is all we have and this is a suggestion that we got can't. Uh, can you guys see my screen? No. Okay. So we have an organization called Mind Organization, which is a non uh, NGO. Uh, an, a charity run organization uh, which uh, is working currently with the government of which is working currently with the government of Punjab uh, to provide uh, a helpline so they have psychiatrists on board and they are willing to provide uh, health care for people who are who are in need of it and if you want anyone to talk out your problems talk out your issues because at the end even we are not professional psychiatrists right so this is the number, uh, if you can take a screenshot or take a picture of it, this is the number that they've given us and uh, these are the approaches that they have. Yeah, so Hazel has mentioned the headline uh, number in this uh, group as well, okay? So 
this organization is providing is providing ment uh, mental uh, a helpline uh, service so if anyone's having any issues please contact them all right um is there any questions We'll give like five minutes for those who want to have uh, who has any questions and hopefully we can answer. Um, Heather, you can talk on the mic as well. Oh, all right. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and try to answer Ikra's question. Um, Ikra, again, this must be a very difficult time as we are, as we all understand, it's sort of really really gets to all of us you know the entire thing about staying at home and not having a lot of distractions being away from our routine because to face the brunt of it very easily it's just that a lot of us had most of our coping mechanisms as distractions you know we just used to keep ourselves busy and maybe just forget about it and think about it later but i get what you mean honestly there is there is no one answer to this we can give you a suggestion maybe again but that's going to be a personal suggestion i'm not sure if it's going to help i hope it does but if if a real recommendation is in order then i feel like you could maybe call the helpline and talk to one of the psychiatrists for better help and better guidelines or you could try working with the self affirmations but again that's just a personal suggestion we're not professionals we don't know if that's really going to help this particular uh, problem that you have but we feel like it it may be a good shot but you could maybe consider calling the helpline for further guidance and further help because this is a very serious question that you have and i don't feel comfortable answering it just without knowing all the facts as a professional i hope you understand please please let us know if you have any other questions apart from this I will have a look at the other question for them and see if anyone else would like to answer. Um, uh, yeah, I can um, answer to the question that Aruba asked. Uh, I'll repeat her question uh, just for everyone to see. She asked that um, at the very start, we mentioned that excessive washing hands could lead to OCD, and OCD is due to behavioral patterns caused by genetic, genetic factors. So it wouldn't develop um, to it. Uh, yeah, actually, um, it may, maybe I didn't word it right. I actually said, okay, um, in people who have OCD and other types of anxiety, um, being told to constantly wash your hands and being alone in isolation is worsening the condition. So yeah, it's not causing OCD, but for people who do have anxiety or tendencies to um, compulsive disorders, uh, it can get it's been getting worse for them, uh, as seen by many uh, organizations that deal with these things. There's been an increase in support requests from those people. So um, basically, uh, I'll, I'll give a quote from one of the persons uh, who mentioned it. Uh, if we're forced to stay at home, we have lots of time on our hands and boredom can make OCD worse. So because they're not as distracted by other things and that you have time on your own and you're constantly told to do the same things over and over to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Um, people who have compulsive disorders uh, have been seeing it to get worse. So uh, that's why the, the point was for people who are facing some types of anxiety disorders to not wash your hands too excessively and be a bit careful about this. Uh, I hope that exp explains your question. Um, is it all right if I take uh, the next question, the one about panic attacks? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So I understand your question about the panic attacks. It's a valid question. And honestly, I feel like I'm going to give my own opinion on it, my own perspective on it. Again, seeing as none of us is a professional here, it is still going to be better if you take this with a grain of salt. Do your own research, maybe go about it, because again, the idea is to, you know, improve our own perception of what we can do i feel like the most important thing you need to do is if possible remove yourself from the situation 
For example, if you're having an argument with someone and the argument leads to a panic attack, just request that you guys stop the discussion or the argument. And if that doesn't work, then maybe if reasonably possible, try to physically isolate yourself from that situation, even if it's just for a while, and then ground yourself. I say this because this is what I feel like I would do in this kind of a situation. But as to if it's the best course of action to do when it comes to grounding in this kind of situation, unfortunately, I do not have all the facts about that. I will try to research this on my own as well. I urge you to do the same and maybe we can find a solution that is different from this because I understand this solution in itself also has some problems because reciprocate if the person does not cooperate with you in sort of like seizing the conflict and sort of giving you your space and time to ground yourself, then it's going to be a problem. But as far as I can think, this is something that I, I personally would do. I, I hope I hope that helps somehow. And I hope you find the answer to your question. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. 